The following program is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministries. The subject of the sermon this morning, choose faithfulness. Choose faithfulness. If you were here last Sunday, the subject was choose love. We are looking in this month of January at those things, those values that we as a church hold and we want everybody collectively to embrace and practice. And of course, at the top of that list, the greatest commandment is that we love one another. I told you on last Sunday that if somebody comes and they observe us, I want them to see as our brand to see the identifying mark on us, and that identifying mark is love. Well, after they see our love, I want them to see our faithfulness. But they can only see that if you and I make the choice to be faithful. Amen? And so what I want to help you to do in these next two sermons because if I preach it in one, it would take me too long. And so I'm breaking it up. You get part one today and part two next week. And, I, and I'm going to show you uh, why it is important to be faithful. But before I can talk about the, the why and the how and the benefits of being faithful, I need to set the context for the atmosphere, if you will, or for the culture in which you and I are called to be faithful. And so Matthew 25 provides for us a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. And our faithfulness sets in that picture of what the kingdom of God looks like. And so here we go. Jesus is on his way out. He has his disciples together and he's giving them several discourses about the end of time as well as his return. And he's trying to get them to understand these deep spiritual principles. And I want everybody who preaches and teaches to pay attention. And so what he does then to help them understand is that he, he uses familiar experiences from their own world to teach them these principles. He does not go way up in the sky to what I call those giraffe words and concepts and ideas and ask people to come up to it. But he goes down low into their own experience and draws them upward to him. Because if you want to teach somebody something, you got to start where they are. And there are several pictures that that he used in, in, in Matthew 25, 24, 25, 26. The first one, for, your, for example, is he talks about a wedding. And everybody in that day knew about a wedding. And he uses a wedding to talk about spiritual principles. And here in this context, he talks about masters and servants. Because in his day, masters and servants were common. And people understood the relationship between the master and the servant. And we don't quite get it, and so I'm, I'm going to just break it down to make sure that you and I understand it. Then I tell you what I'm talking about. So here it is. He says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It is like a man who was traveling on a journey. In other words, he was going away to stay for a while. But this man, who is the master, he had a kingdom. He had a farm. He had a business. And he wanted his business to continue to operate while he was going away. And so, the Bible says, he called his servants and gave them his goods for the purpose of operating his kingdom, his business, while he was gone. And next week, we'll we will see that he told them and said, now I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And when I come back, I want you to account for how you operated my kingdom, my business, while 
I was gone. And in verse 14, there are several principles about this, this master-servant relationship that I want to pull out of us, pull out for us. The first one is, the owner or the master went away. But it didn't mean he relinquished ownership to what was his. He is not physically present, but the kingdom still belonged to him. He is not here, but there's still an expectation that his kingdom operates and that the kingdom is fruitful and productive. And his hopes for that lies in the stewardship of his servants. In other words, he's depending on his servants to make it happen for him. He's not coming back to do it and then run back. When he comes back, he's coming back at the end. Listen at the language again. And the master or the man going away called his servants. That's the first real principle for us. If you and I are going to be faithful in this kingdom of God, then we have to understand who we belong to. His servants, principle, you and I belong to him. And if you're going to be faithful to him, you got to settle that in your mind. You belong to him. And he didn't call you his peer, his counterpart, but he called you, he called me his servant. And so, I have to become comfortable. You have to become comfortable with the idea that you and I are a servant of God and we belong to him. Kingdom principle, not a democratic principle. In a democracy like we live in, the government is for the people, by the people. That's what it says. Well, in a kingdom, the government is not by the people. It's run by the king. And the servants are subject to the king. You and I belong to him. Old timers, listen to me. We grew up on a song by the Isley Brothers, right? Y'all help me say it. It's your thing. Do what to what? You can't tell me. All right. Hear me. The principles in that song do not apply to kingdom folk. It's not your thing because you don't belong to yourself. You can't do what you want to do because you belong to him and you got to do what your master says do. Servant owned by the master. In Jesus' day, there was a symbol of a servant and that symbol was an ox. And the ox represented two levels of service. One, the ox was available by the owner to go into the field to serve using labor, pulling, plowing, or to carry heavy loads. And so the ox could be placed in service by the master. But you know what else? The ox also understood and the master understood that at any moment that ox could be used or called upon to sacrifice his life. And be placed on an altar. So their service and their sacrifice connected to it. And so the question for you and I is, is, as we understand this concept of servant and master, are you ready to surrender in service and sacrifice, even the ultimate sacrifice, to your master? And again, I got to settle that because I can't be faithful to my master until I settle this ownership piece and my willingness for service and sacrifice. Make it plain, Pastor Simmons. Okay. I like making it plain. So, service means that when the master called, I got the answer. Sacrifice means that when it's not convenient, I got to go. Service means that I don't get to choose what I want to do, but the master sets the agenda. Sacrifice means I may have to give up some stuff, even my rights, 
But if the master requires it, then that's what I got to do. And when I'm working for the master and I understand that, then the, then the book of Colossians chapter 3 come into play. What, whenever you do, whatever work you do, you do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. You, you missed that. You, you heard the surface. See, if you're working for men, for people, then when people upset you, you are mad. And you don't want to work because of what some people do to you. You quit ministry. Because of what people do for you, do to you. But if you understand, you're not working for people. But you're working unto the Lord, and it's from the Lord your reward comes. Why are you looking for a pat on the back, for a nod, for approval, for acceptance from people? Who, who, who owns you? Again, when I settle this ownership and I'm in service and sacrifice for, for, for him, then that, that concept influences me in several ways, but let me give you two of them. First of all, it influences my decisions. When I have decisions before me, I make those decisions differently than I would if I were not a servant. As a servant, any decision I make has to be approved by the master. What you going to do today, Simmons? I don't know. I got to, you know, see what the master say. Hey, Simmons, come over here and help me do that. No, I, I, I got another master. When, when you uh, get your directions from, from the master, then you got to decide, am I going to let other folks set my agenda? Am I going to set my own agenda? Or will I let the master set my agenda? So it influences your decisions. And also, when you understand this, this principle, uh, it, it influences your steps. Uh, all of my steps. And so, see, see, the servant can't just go where the servant wants to go. The boundaries of the servants are set by the master. And in order to be faithful, I got to make sure that I operate within the boundaries of where the master set tell me to go. When I was growing up, I used to work in the uh, tobacco field, okra field, and in one particular okra field I used to work, there were two brothers and they had their fields side by side. And there were literally just one row that separated one brother's okra field from the other. And I was hired to work for one. And so I worked in his field and I was a faithful worker. But if I had stepped over in the brother's field and worked as good as, as, good as I could work, do as good a job as I could do, that work wouldn't have amounted to anything because I was in the wrong field. And the brother wouldn't have been obligated to pay me for any okra I cut in his field because he didn't tell me to go over there. My instructions was to work in this field. And so your steps are ordered by your master. You can't go where you want to go. Your decisions are influenced by him. And again, if I'm going to be faithful, I have to embrace this idea that I am a servant. My decisions are influenced and my steps are influenced by my master. If I am going to be faithful, not only are my decisions and my steps influenced by my master, but my relationships are influenced by my master. First of all, I need to develop a relationship with the master. If I'm going to be faithful to him, I need a relationship with him. And so, I submit to you that that's, that should be the first relationship in your life. Is your relationship to him. And then secondly, the relationships that I have with other people, they are influenced by my master. Because my master tells me who I can and can't have a relationship with. What are you saying, Pastor Simmons? I am saying that first and foremost, God is your primary relationship. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the greatest commandment? To love God all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then after that, when you develop relationship with other people, then let God order those relationships because he's your master. So let's, let, let's just pretend. Let's just say you see somebody 
and you are attracted to them, they're the most beautiful person you've ever seen. She's beautiful. He's handsome. Your heart just beat fast when you get around him and you flutter, and, and you just want him, you want her. But what you've got to do is check with the master to see if you can have him. And if the master say you can't have him, then you need to keep on moving. If the master says, don't be unequally yoked with non-believers, then you don't need to yoke yourself up. If the master says, leave that one alone, leave that one alone, then you just need to start stepping. No matter what your heart feels, no matter what you think, when the master says, that's, that's, that's it. Young folk and old people, the master says good company, bad company corrupts good behavior. And so when I find myself surrounded by bad company, I hear my master saying, what did I tell you? You can't put hot coals in your chest and not get burned. You can't keep hanging around dirt and don't think dirt going to rub off on you. So relationships, and let me tell you why the relationships are so important. Number one, I cannot be faithful to God without God. I can't do anything without him. And so I got to make sure that relationship was right, is right. But let me tell you this that, that you might miss. The most important thing after your relationship with God that determines your success or your failure, your climbing or your falling, is the relationships you're in. The people you connect yourself to have a great influence on your future. Show me who you're hanging with and I'll show you where you're going. You don't have to tell me anything about who you are. Just tell me who your five closest friends are and I can tell you all about yourself. How can two walk together except they agree? If I'm not a thug, it's going to be impossible for me to maintain a close relationship with a thug because we can't talk, we got nothing to talk about. You, you got one mind, I got another mind. What we going to do? I don't, I don't need you riding anywhere with me. I can ride by myself and talk to myself. Because if you ride, we don't have anything to talk about. And some of us, some of us have gotten confused. We have a relationship with God, but we are not God. What are you trying to say, Pastor? Some of us are in the business of playing God, and we'll hook up with anything and think we can change. But only God is in the changing business. College students, I, I want you to try something for me. And, and, and let me know how you come out. High school students, middle school, elementary students, I want you to try, try this for me and let me know how you come out. When you, when you go back to school, find you three of the smartest people in your class and say, hey, I want to hang out with you. Can, can we have a study group together? Can, can we have a little agreement when I'm doing homework and, and we just call and talk to each other and we just help each other out? Can, can, can we do that? And you may be a C student, but I promise you, if you get in, in that little group with the A and the B students and you start spending time and sharing and hanging out with them, your grades will start climbing. Now, you reverse that. You're a C student. You're hanging out with the Ds and the Fs. Guess where you are going to be before long? You're going to move from the C to the D to the E to the F. What's the E past the exit? Show me who you're hanging with. But in order to be faithful, I've got to let him order my relationships. Know you not that you are not your own? Or that you've been bought with the price? And that price was Jesus Christ dying on the cross to purchase you? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God and God dwells in you? 
because you belong to him. And so that ownership piece, our relationship with him is in, there, it's influenced by that and in, in our relationship with other people. And so we belong to him. Here's the last thing I say about that relationship with other people and him. Because you belong to him, you can't give yourself away to anybody else. Don't you let anybody else take ownership of you now. Say, so, hey, now, we are connected by relationship, but you don't own me now. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not your property. I'm, I'm, I'm already obligated to somebody else. So if you want a healthy relationship where we are bound together by relationship and not ownership, then we, we, we can go somewhere, but, but don't, don't start talking and acting like you own me. You can't tell me what to do because I already got somebody telling me that. You can't tell me what's right and wrong because I already got somebody telling me that. At least I keep you too long. There's, there's one other piece in there. And he called his servants. Personal possessive pronoun. And gave them his goods. That's another personal uh, possessive pronoun. And don't miss it. The servants didn't have anything that belonged to them to do business with. And so the master gave them his goods to do business on his behalf. And goods represent everything that they had. They were living on the master's land. They were living on the master's time, eating the master's food, breathing the master's air. And everything they had to operate came from the master. Do you acknowledge, embrace the fact in a real way, that all of your resources that you have to do business belong to the Lord? Let's see. Let's, let's see if you mean it. Do, 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 do you acknowledge that your time is a resource that God has given you to use to do business with? And that it belongs to him? Question then, how much of your time does he get? How much of your time is set aside for his business? And hear me, I believe that everything we do, whether you work at some company in town, wherever we are, we represent God. If I'm a student, I represent God. So in the context of how we spend our time, how much of it do we acknowledge God's right to that time? And when it comes to the church, this is how most of us operate. God get what's left. Other things come before him and when we have time, we stop by here. We are more faithful to jobs than we are to God. Got a headache. I can't come to church today. But that same headache, you're, you're behind going to work in the morning. It's raining. Huh? I can't get out in that rain. But let it be storming and raining. Unless they call and say, don't come in today. You're going to work. Can't go to church today. Man does not live by bread alone. And so part, part of his time, part of our time in relationship to God means we get fed. And so we come to church and we go other places to get our spiritual bodies fed. Some of us got some peculiar appetites. Y'all must be fasting because I don't see you but once a month. I guess y'all on a Daniel fast. You fasted from Daniel Simmons. How, how, how much time? Pastor Emma, hurry, hurry. you got you got to hurry up now because you know you can't keep me here late. Empire come on tonight, and I I can't miss that. The new season of scandal start. I can't miss that. Don't you know there's another empire that has a king on it, on the throne, and and, and so you see. So let me let me move these out territory, and then your your talents, your gifts. God has blessed you. Everybody in here with gifts. Do, 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 do you use them in service to the master? That wonderful mind God has given you, that wonderful intellect, those wonderful gifts, you can do things and you do them uniquely, but how much of it is given in service to the Lord rather than just in service to you and other people? 
Every church that I know struggles with volunteers to come and work. We don't struggle with people in the pew, but we struggle with volunteers. We don't struggle with uh, what's called Monday morning quarterbacks. Those are the folk that sit back and complain how it should have ought to go, but you don't do anything. But you know how everybody else should have been doing what they were doing, but you don't do it. And so just, just imagine the impact of the body of Christ if all of the gifts in this room this morning were being used in the service of our master. But God expects us to be faithful with the stuff he gave us. And there's not a person in here that hadn't been given something. You may not know what it is yet, but, 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 but you got something. Every member of the body of Christ has been given a gift for the edification of the body. And some of you, the gift is as simple as a smile. There are some of you that got these magnetic smiles. And, and we need you to just stand on the door and when people come in, just say hello and smile. Some of you got a smile on you. I don't care what a person been going through. Once you throw that smile on them, it just melts away. But we don't get the smile because you won't use it in service. Let me say this one, and uh, some of y'all might have to help me not be bodyguards. Treasure, treasure. Your treasure. Whatever it is, it's it's his stuff. And if it's his, it's not yours. And if it's his, if it's his, you can't do what you want to do. You can't spin it like you want to. It's not your treasure to do what you want to do. And he expects us to be faithful in the use of our treasure. And, and again, time, talent, treasure, we can measure that. All, all, all we got to do is look at how you use your treasure and, and, and we can determine um, where your loyalty really lies. If most of your treasure is going to you, for you, on you, you sleep on it, you ride in it, and you wear it. And you eat it. But the Lord gave me common sense. He, he wants me to take care of me. God, that ain't what God told you. First, the kingdom of God. So where, 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 um, where is it going? So I just see how, see how you spend it. And I know y'all don't like for pastors to talk about, about this. Uh, you know, all, all I got to do is pull your giving. I mean, I'm not impressed with your shout now. Let, let me see how, 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 how they give, not how, how they shout. I'm not talking about you. I, 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 didn't, I didn't call your name. To... Thanks for watching. Be blessed and continue walking in the light.